Hi, my name is Justin Lebrecht, and I'm a principal consulting engineer with MongoDB. Um, just a little bit of background on myself. I am, uh, I've, I've been a principal consulting engineer with MongoDB for about four years now, and my job is to work directly with customers, so working with people like yourself um, to help them solve problems. I do uh, not only education about MongoDB, but also helping to create uh, plans, long-term, short-term plans for software products, as well as work with customers on any issues that they might have. So I have a lot of experience working with schema design with our customers. So I'm going to be bringing that experience as well as customer stories to this presentation. And my name is Daniel Coupal. I work in the education department at MongoDB. My team produces all the courses available on our uh, university site. Uh, we also work in collaboration with consulting engineers like Justin to create contents for the course uh, that are delivered to our customers. And I also I am very passionate about uh, data modeling. So that should be fun. So let's get going. OK, so our presentation will be divided into four sections. First, we will describe what the schema design patterns are. Then we'll give an overview of the methodology we use to model a schema. And we'll show where the schema design patterns fit in that methodology. And we'll use uh, a single view example to introduce uh, all the patterns in the next section where are we gonna apply those? So the reason we're doing this talk is to help customers succeed. Um, I work with customers often as a consulting engineer, and when it comes to creating schema, um, we're either working on new projects or migrating off of um, existing legacy database platforms. Um, patterns are specifically useful because it helps jumpstart the development process. It's much faster and a quicker way to implement and improve uh, your application's speed and design. So we want to help you with this process. So that's why we're doing this talk today. Um, we're going to continue through and define what these patterns actually are. So that brings us to our first section. So what are the patterns? Well, we can make a parallel between MongoDB uh, schema design pattern with the software design patterns described by the Gang of Four. So this is the classic software engineering book written by Eric Gamma and his friends using the many years of experience designing software architectures. So the software design patterns are not full solution to problems. And similarly, or software or schema design patterns are also not full solution to problems. They are building blocks. Uh, or consulting uh, engineers like Justin identify those blocks over many years. Um, they act as a common language with our team. And uh, when someone uses a pattern name, there should be no ambiguity about the intent of the design. So what can patterns do for you? The most common thing will be to help improve the performance of your schema. Also, some patterns help simplify the access to the data by grouping or prearranging the data in, in a simpler form. Are there any caution in using the patterns? Sure. The first one is some of them are bringing duplication of data. Well, as we may have been used to uh, be told to this is not not a good thing to have duplication of data, especially when you try to have a normal form in your model. Uh, often, it is not you know, the case. There, there, there are situations where duplication of data may even be something desirable. For example, let's assume that I'm going to have invoices, and I need to track the address uh, of the invoice where I'm going to ship this information. Well, if we have a normal form, and we have a relationship between voice to the addresses. If we change the address, we basically change the address for all the invoices. So you see, in this case, it makes more sense to have the information about the address being inside the invoice, and even if it's duplicated. So you'll see a lot of these cases in system where duplication of data is not that bad. And some patterns bringing you basically uh, these cases just to make things faster. So there's also some cases where you can have some staleness of data. You can apply the same reasoning here, uh, how much you know, staleness is acceptable or not. Uh, but it's something you have to be careful of. So you, you need to understand basically what your system uh, 
it's going to be dealing with. Is it okay, not okay for each type of data, basically? So understanding of the data at the beginning is very, very important. They can also bring so the, some denormalizations uh, but if you're used from uh, the SQL world, this is not something that's going to be new to you. Often the process when you design for SQL is to have something that is normalized, but as soon as you try to improve performance, that's one of the first avenues you're going to look at. So the patterns may also use that technique, but right away at the beginning, understanding that we're trying to get optimizations. Here's a list of the main patterns we documented. So the table shows the most likely patterns you will encounter while developing a given type of application. Note that the table is for reference only. It's not set in stone. It's just to guide you toward the patterns you should be looking for. For example, if you have an application that's Internet of Things, those are probably the most likely patterns. So today we'll go over a few of those patterns, the list. Um, however, before we do so, let's see how they fit in the overall methodology for modeling for MongoDB. So we'll have a quick tour of our methodology. So while we're on the topic of methodology, um, Daniel did create another presentation that goes much more in depth on data modeling methodology. Um, it's part of MongoDB Live, and it should be available for you to view. So if you haven't already seen that, I recommend checking it out. In an ideal world, customers design with both simplicity and performance as the goal. MongoDB provides that mixture of simplicity and performance for most early release projects. Um, so this kind of really allows developers to design with simplicity and performance just kind of naturally follows. That's one of the great benefits of using MongoDB is that with simplicity, you also get that performance. But as software grows, complexity generally grows, right? And as complexity grows, performance naturally just tends to decrease. Things get more complicated, so performance will decrease because more complication requires more com computation, et cetera, et cetera. Companies that grow have to scale. Scale requires a lot of time thinking about performance. So customers that succeed at scaling really spend time thinking about schema and thinking about performance. With additional performance benefits, unfortunately, we don't gain more simplicity. We have to think more about ways of making things faster, and that might sacrifice a little bit of simplicity. So for larger projects, it makes a lot of sense to decide early on that you're going to spend more time on the schema design. With that schema design, you need to focus on the performance. That emphasis on performance will reduce the need for subsequent release phases and major schema changes in the long term. Okay, let's look at the methodology. What is available for you to do the design of your schema? Well, first, Maybe there's documented scenarios coming from a requirement document. Uh, maybe you're migrating from the existing system that's inside the relational database. So you've built a prototype. So in both cases, you probably have logs or stats that you can use for your design. You may have a business domain expert. You can interview, ask a bunch of questions, will guide you toward you know, how the system is supposed to work. And uh, you may have a data modeling expert to help you in the process. Hopefully, you can be the one having this role once you get through our training. So taking those inputs here, as you may guess, our first phase will be describing their workload. So before we do any relationship, uh, we model, model any relationship, what we want to do is take this input and identify what are the most important operations. For those operations, we're going to qualify them and quantify them. And that first phase will also take the opportunity to look at all the resources we need. Uh, that could be uh, servers, uh, disk space, uh, et cetera, network uh, requirements. So we're looking at that. And as we're doing that, there's probably a few things that we are not sure. So it's the time also to make assumption. Uh, maybe we think that something will be limited to a number 1,000. Let me have a one thousand maximum friends, for example. And as we go further in a project or in deployment operation, if some of these assumptions end up being wrong, those will be very good indicator that we should go back to the board and relook at our design to see the impact of being wrong on those assumptions. So I'm, I'm really pro you know, writing down all these assumptions as early as possible and tracking them. Out of that phase, we'll have a good understanding of what are the most important operations. And what we're going to do now is model all the data we have. Any two piece of data in our system has a relationship. 
It could be a one-to-one, -one, a one-to-many, or many-to-many. So we're going to identify those. We're going to also quantify. Uh, it's easy to say one to many, but in the world of big data, many may also mean a thousand or a million. And you know, when you have this kind of cardinality, it can have a huge impact on your design. So identifying and flagging those like extremely huge number right at the beginning will make sense. And then you can answer the most important question on your design. Uh, should you embed or link that relationship? So embed means I'm going to take the two piece of information and they're going to be in the same collection. And linking means the two piece of information will live in different collection and we will reference one to the other one. Once we get that, we have something that is still pretty relational. It's still pretty square. Uh, it's like nerdy, still the third normal form. So what we need to do now, if we want something that is much better is to apply a pattern. So that's gonna be a third phase. We need to recognize that there's a need to apply a pattern and then know how to apply it. So we said that we want the methodology to be flexible and we were just in talking about simplicity versus performance. So if simplicity is what you're striving for, you don't have to do all the steps in each phase, but there are things that are probably still very important that we want you to do. You should at least be able to identify easily what's the most frequent operation. You may want, not want to have all the details on it, but knowing which one you're gonna be designed for is gonna be very important. In the question of embedding or linking, you'll probably mostly embed, put all the things together. Usually it leads for a much simpler application, the objects are together, you don't need to do an extra query to retrieve something or to do a join or look up in between to bring the information. The pattern bringing performance and sometimes complexity, you're probably not going to apply as many as a solution that would be more complex. At the other end of the spectrum, as you may guess, we probably want to list all the operations. Uh, we want to qualify them, quantify them, get as much information on them, especially the ones that are the most important. We'll probably get a mix of embedding and linking, so we don't have to bring all the objects, uh, large objects in memory. There are parts we don't use, we don't want to have that. And then, Pattern-wise, we'll probably apply a lot more pattern. And as you may guess, there's an in-between for those, which is we do a little bit more description on the workload, and we apply uh, some patterns, but maybe not as much as if we're really trying to optimize everything for performance. So that brings us to the third section of our talk, where we're going to introduce our use case. So the Mongo Insurance Corporation needs to unify a few systems using uh, our, our DBMSs. So the project they're going to do is uh, called Mongo Insurance Portal, MIP for short. So as you can guess, MIP means they want something that's really fast. So the top requirements for this project is going to be we want to be merging legacy systems. We want a super fast user interface. If there's other stuff that needs to be done on the data query and all that, that's gonna be done in batch through analytics. And we want to think a little bit more about the future system uh, that may help the customers access the same data through uh, an app on their phone or something like that. So we, we, we get these requirements. Out of those, our first operation, our first step would be to list all the operation. So for example, we said that we need to sync with all the systems, so that's gonna be a right operation. And we're gonna apply all the changes on our databases back in our system. And then we have a few queries like load user profile, load overview of the account. These are basically the UI driven queries uh, to get information and construct uh, our website. We're going to need to process claims and uh, user portal operation. I put a question mark, you know, this is just to let you know that at this point, what we're going to do is really focus on what we need to do now. For the things that are in the future, it's nice to think about it, but the great thing with MongoDB, it's very easy to make changes to the schema. So let's concentrate on the thing that, you know, we need to end on. After we get the list of operation, let's put some numbers on them. Let's qualify them. So, for example, if we take the first one, syncing the change to uh, our MIP system, well, maybe we do it once a day. 
So that means 24 writes a day. If it takes up to 10 minutes, it's fine. It's critical, right? You know, we don't want to want to be sure we're not losing anything. Everything's in sync there. And then we go like that on and on for all the queries. The thing to pay attention here is those three queries, which are building the UI, seems to be the most important. You know, we have a response time of two milliseconds. This is not the response time on the UI. This is the budget that the team who's building the whole system is giving us, the people who handle the database. That's the time we have to get the data back to the UI. So uh, all our queries need to be fast. That's basically what we've been told. And we have some numbers. We can play with that. So we have a good understanding of what or uh, or queries are at this point. So basically, what we've been told is, you know, this is the UI. So getting this information when the user login has to be fast, getting the navigation bar has to be fast, and any page in the middle, which is uh, either the like overview one or this one, you retrieve the document, also has to be fast. So that's a pretty simple requirement if you look at that. Now, looking at the relationship between the data, uh, the entities are users, policy, claims, bill, documents, message. These are all the things we can identify from queries or from our UI. And if we're going on the simplicity side, uh, we could easily say, hey, you know, we're going to have a major big collection of users in which we're going to put the policy claims. So everything is kind of linked, you know, as a relationship of one to many, and everything is going to be embedded. So that's a pretty simple um, collection that we have here. It's a pretty simple system. So the issue we may have with that is that is unlikely to be fast enough. So this is where we're going to use our next phase. We'll apply some magic. So then I'll let Justin... Uh, do that with uh, the application of some patterns on your design. So the next set of our talk is going to be on applying patterns. And we're going to talk a lot about how those patterns are applied. And specifically, the way that we derive this is based on other customer experiences. So we're going to talk a lot about ways of um, working with our mock-up and generating our patterns based on that. So this is the mock-up that we received in order to generate our portal. And what we're going to do is we're going to physically identify the different domains that we need to render. Right? One of the requirements is that we render this page extremely fast. And to do that, we're actually going to physically draw boxes around the different domains. And the way that we're going to do that is by first finding the most commonly loaded part of the page. The header is displayed at every single page load. So we need to ensure that that's especially fast. The navigation system is also displayed very, very frequently. Now, the navigation system is the first time that things really start to change on this page, right? Every page load, the user information is going to stay the same, but the navigation will change from user to user, and it will also possibly change as um, other areas of the site change, for example, the number of claims. And then finally, we have the main body. We also want the main body of the page to be able to load fast. So what we're going to do is we have our physical boxes, and we're going to look at each one individually to figure out how we can minimize the load time for each individual section. We're going to start with the header, right? This is, again, the most frequently loaded thing on the page, so we need to make sure that it loads very, very fast. What information is actually displayed? Well, we have the username, so the person's name, as well as that kind of circle there that might be user profile uh, photo. In this particular case, we don't have a photo, so the thing that we need to keep is the user name. Now, the best strategy for this is to query that data once and then keep that information in the session. Right? Sessions are generally in most languages available right away, so storing this information in the session is super convenient, and it makes that header load extremely fast. So that asks the question, what is the second most used section? And that is that navigation again. The navigation has a bunch of information on it. We can see that we have a policies, which has a list of things. We have open claims. Specifically, we have a count of open claims. We have billing, where we have the amount due. We have documents, which again is a count, and messages, which has a count as well. We have some requirements that we need to meet. We saw this a little bit earlier, but now we're really going to focus on this. We see that the user profile load has a requirement to load in less than two milliseconds. We also have that less than two milliseconds for the overview of accounts, which is our navigation. And then any details also has to be less than two milliseconds. So we have our requirements laid out here. 
what we're going to do is we're going to apply our methodology to ensure that we meet those goals. Because we have a UI, we're really going to focus on the second and third phase of the methodology. As you go through this experience more and more, it gets easier and easier to do both pieces at the exact same time. So identify the model in relationship and apply patterns are the two things we're going to look at. Now, I'm going to separate them out and talk about them as two very distinct phases because they are. But again, as you get better at this and as you visualize, uh, because you have a visual representation, this process will become faster and you'll essentially do both at the exact same time. Now here we have, again, the navigation bar. The question is, what is the scope of our navigation bar? What is the relationship, right? Phase two has to do with relationships. So what do policies relate to? What do open claims relate to? Well, how does this navigation section change? Well, I can tell you when I load this page, I'm going to have a set of policies. When you load this page, you're going to have a different set of policies. So that seems to lend that there is a relationship between a user account or user and policies. So given the visual here, we've dictated that there's a relationship between policies and users. How about for open claims? Well, realistically, claims have a relationship to policies, right? If you have a policy for your home and a policy for your car, the relationship is between each individual policy and uh, the claim itself. But visually, we don't seem to care much about where those policies actually uh, lay. Even though we might have a policy or a claim open for a home policy and a claim open for a car policy, we're only displaying a number here. So we don't necessarily care about the relationship between claim and policies. What we do care about is, nav is creating this number at the time of navigation. And we've already identified that there is a relationship between navigating at the user level and the uh, number that we have to display at the claim. So now we've identified two relationships, both relating back to the user. The third is the billing. Billing is a little bit more unique because we have the amount due displayed. Each individual policy might have its own premium, but we're not showing information about each individual policy. We're showing the total due for all of your policies. So again, we have a relationship not between billing and policies, but between billing and users. We have documents, which again is a count, so that's very similar to open claims. We have the exact same relationship because even though a document might be applied to a specific policy, we're not caring about the individual policies because from a visual perspective, we have our requirements that say the link must exist between documents and the user. And then similarly for messages. Messages has a real relationship between messages and the user. For example, if I was inquiring about creating a new policy, that message would come directly to me and wouldn't actually have anything to do with a policy because that policy hasn't yet been created. So now that we have our relationships, we need to go on to the next portion, which is identifying our simplicity versus performance spectrum. When we look at phase three, which is identifying our patterns, we have to figure out what it is that we're trying to emphasize. Well, we mentioned earlier that with simplicity, we're keeping everything in one large object. All the information we're gonna have all of your claims, all of your documents, all of your messages in a single object, um, and that is the simplest thing to work with. However, that can create very large documents. Large documents can be unyieldy, they can be cumbersome to maintain, they can be slow to load. Um, they also take up a lot of memory. Memory is your most expensive and valuable resource in a database, so we want to avoid that kind of monolithic object in this case. So looking at the performance side, we could potentially create a collection for each, but what we really want is something in the middle because again, we're trying to load our page as fast as possible. That's our original goal. So we're gonna to try to find a balance and we're going to apply our patterns in order to do that. So the question becomes, what relationship is the most important at this page to generate the navigation bar? We identified that every section within this navigation bar has a relationship to the user's uh, collection or the user's object. So what we're going to do is we're going to store all of the information necessary to generate this bar with the user. We already have the user. It's potentially stored in the session. So just by visiting this page, you have all the information you need to render this section. The way that we're going to render this information and keep it together with the user is by identifying two patterns specifically. And I'm going to introduce the extended reference pattern for things like claims, and the computed pattern for things like billing. 
So first off, what is the computed pattern? The computed pattern is uh, used to store a computed value instead of calculating the value every single time. So storing a value, uh, th that sounds a lot like a view in the SQL or the relational world, no? Yeah, absolutely. It very much is like a view. In the relational world, whenever you have to calculate something, you ultimately have to aggregate across lots of different fee uh, rows in order to create your calculation. In MongoDB, we have an even better approach. This is what it looks like when you aggregate across lots of different rows. You have a single write, and then you try to figure out the count based on all of that information. So in a relational world, your view aggregates. So if you do have a view, your view aggregates on the underlying table. Um, because we have patterns, MongoDB makes this much more efficient by doing some trade-offs. When you design for a website or an application, you're generally making a trade-off between reads and writes. Most applications have about a thousand to one read to write ratio. So because of that, we want to make our reads as fast as possible, right? That's part of the original goal. We can actually increase the number of writes to significantly reduce the number of reads and the time it takes to do a read. So here we can see that instead of aggregating across a bunch of different documents, we're using our computed pattern to store the result of our aggregation. So that's what we're seeing on the right hand side. I also introduced the extended reference pattern. The extended reference pattern keeps a reference to data from one collection to another. Now this is important because again, I mentioned in MongoDB, you want the data to generate a page available when you're trying to generate that page. So because of that, extended reference is very useful because it keeps that information available to the application right when it needs it. Now this does require denormalization. We're denormalizing in order to increase our read performance. MongoDB does not have joins, we have dollar sign lookup, but again, we're trying to make this as fast as possible. Whenever we have to add an additional read, we're adding additional latency to our round trip in order to generate our page. Two reads is going to be slower than run read, so we want to avoid having to do a dollar sign lookup. Visually, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about an extended reference pattern. We're literally copying data from one, uh, one collection to another. So finally, that comes to our schema. We mentioned that there's a relationship between users and the different parts of our application or our navigation. So here we see for the first time what that schema actually looks like. We have our extended reference. Under policies, you see that we have each of our policies, but we're not keeping all of the policy information. A policy generally has a lot more information than we're keeping in this user's collection. For example, there's a policy premium. We don't copy that over because that's not necessary for the generation of our view. What is necessary is the name of the policy as well as some sort of ID that allows us to link on the website to the actual policy and get more information. We have the computed pattern. That computed pattern is what prevents the need to aggregate across multiple documents. Here we have an open claims, a document count, and a message count. Those counts are what we use to generate the display in the navigation very, very quickly. And then finally, we have the billing section. Now this is going to look a little bit different. We're actually combining patterns here. And what you're going to find as you get more and more experience using these different patterns is that a lot of these patterns combine and complement each other in different ways. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this. Let's look at the billing section. Here we have the, date, uh, the month, so 2019-12. And then we have some meta information about what happened during that month. What we're doing is we're doing a little bit more work on the update side, right? Because we're doing extended reference. We know that updates are or writes are going to take a little bit more work to save us work on the reads later. And whenever we have a discrete operation, we're updating our user's collection. Now, billing is a particularly interesting problem. Why don't we just store the current amount owed? Well, let's say that you have a million users and those users all have a different amount owed. If once a month you had to calculate a new premium balance and then completely asynchronously users pay, that means that you're constantly going to be updating every single document in your user's collection. And that's not really maintainable. That's not scalable and that's not um, a great way to implement this solution. What we can do is we can store the discrete actions that happen with the user that's relevant. So if you have a job once a month that comes in and calculates premiums, we can see that we have 
in operation, in this case, in 2019 in December, we have an O operation. So it's kind of like a plus. Then we see every month we have somebody paying towards that premium and we have a paid operation. From the application perspective, we can very quickly calculate by doing addition and subtraction what the total amount owed will be. The application has each individual month as well as the owed and paid operations, and that gives us our total that we actually displayed, which is the due amount of 800. So that's how patterns can be combined to very, very quickly render the page. Finally, we have this middle section, and this is the bulk of the page. Um, it's really what it is that we're trying to get to when we're using our navigation. We can see that there are two different areas that we're trying to generate. There's a list of policies. I've probably clicked on the car link because we're seeing two different car policies. And then we're seeing the claims related to that. I'm going to introduce something called the bucket pattern. The bucket pattern is a type of embedding. It uses arrays in a very intelligent way. So what we're doing is instead of having a document per policy, we're combining the policies together so that when we need to render this page, we can render it very, very quickly. And this is more information about the bucket pattern. The bucket pattern has a single domain object broken up into multiple documents. This really leverages the power of arrays because it lets you keep a set number of things per document. When you combine multiple documents, that gets the sum of all of the related objects. This is used for, keep, for keeping relevant information close together. So if you need to do something like paging, then this pattern is very useful. And we're going to talk about this more. There should be something called the max size of your bucket. How many items should we be storing in this array? The projects where we really see the bucket pattern being used is the Internet of Things projects. And Justin can confirm, I'm sure every single customer who has this type of project is using it. Basically, if you look at this project, there's two extreme ways to represent the data. One is the device will send their data and for every single little metric will create the little document. And the other extreme will be, we'll create one document with all the metrics for a given device. Well, both end don't really work very well. So the bucket metric is really an in-between solution to these two, where metrics get grouped together, either per hour, per day, you choose. Uh, but that's what it is. It's, see it as an in-between solution and grouping data. So this is absolutely what we see most customers use, especially when it comes to Internet of Things, uh, for scaling purposes. So if you're trying to do something that requires scale, the bucket pattern is really useful because what we're doing, again, is breaking up a large set of documents, or a large set of things, into multiple documents. Now, looking back at our original page, what we're doing is we're displaying um, a list of policies. And given that, we need to only keep a subset of policies in order to generate this display. We're also keeping claims along with the policy. So let's actually see what that looks like in terms of schema. This is our policies collection. And we can see that there are two extended references within our bucket pattern. So similar to what we saw before with extended reference, we have information about a car. The car is relevant to the policy. Now, there might be another collection called cars that has much more information about these cars. For example, how are we applying individual cars to policies? Here, we only need enough information to generate the display. So what we have is just the name type year and some attributes. Now, these are all contained within a larger bucket. The reason this bucket pa pattern is so powerful is because it allows us to embed intelligently. You'll notice at the very top of the screen, we have an underscore ID, and that underscore ID references the user object. So we are now referencing back, and we're intelligently bucketing our data so that can be displayed efficiently. We, again, have enough policy information to display what we need to display when we need to display it. We're going to go further on this idea, and we're going to look at a different screen. So we're assuming that we've clicked on the document link and we know from the user session or the user's collection that we have the total count document count of eight. We know that there should be eight things, but we're only displaying six on the screen. So we're going to again consider the bucket pattern, but I'm also going to introduce another pattern called the outlier pattern. The outlier pattern is 
when we focus on an 80 versus 20% use case. Specific to the word outlier, an outlier is something that occurs rarely, right? So in this case, we're increasing the amount of work that has to be done to generate our outliers versus our 80% or a high use case. The way that we do that is by creating another collection that's called overflow to keep the outliers separate. Now, because we're creating another collection, that means we also need to represent a new code path. We have to write a new code path in order to access those overflows. So there is additional work when it comes to the outlier um, pattern, but this is really useful for releasing things in phases. So which do we choose? Do we choose the bucket pattern or the outlier pattern? Well, we have to make a choice. The way that we make that choice is by looking at our data. This is much easier to do when you have an existing project that you're migrating than it is with brand new projects, but because we are migrating from an existing source, we have the ability to create a histogram of our documents. Right? We have existing customers, and those customers each have documents associated with them, so we can see what frequency we have different sizes of documents. And we can see that most users have between 0 and 60 documents. That gives us a size for our bucket. Right? I mentioned that a bucket should have a maximum size. We don't want an ever-growing array because we have the possibility of hitting that 60 megabyte cap and large documents are just unyieldy to manage. So we want a maximum and this is how we determine our maximum is by data-driven solutions. The outlier pattern would be useful for our outliers. We see that we have a very long tail. After about 61 documents, it's very uncommon to have that many documents associated with the user. So now we have two different solutions that we can use, and let's see what those look like. Again, we have the documents collection with the bucket pattern. This is what that would look like. Again, our underscore ID references our user account, and we have a bucket that contains six documents. Why six? In this case, our display physically shows six documents, and going back to our original idea that the data should be stored as it's needed, we need to display six documents, so that's why we have a bucket of six. But we had a total of eight, right? The document count said eight. So what do we do with the rest? This is the fundamental part of the bucket pattern. The bucket pattern allows us to keep two documents that look similar, but have different sets of data. We have a bucket of six and a bucket of two, eight, six plus two equals eight, so that gives us the total number of documents. You'll notice that the underscore ID continues to reference the user. So if we needed to get all the information, all documents for a user, we could very quickly use a range query or regular expression to query based on underscore ID to get all of those different documents. Now, there's also a timestamp. We need some sort of value to differentiate because underscore ID is a primary key. We can't just use the number 10,000. So this is what the bucket pattern looks like, but we still need to make a choice. We can also use the overflow pattern. The overflow pattern represents this data exactly the same. What we're doing is we're creating another collection with the overflow. So if you recall our original schema, we had six documents contained in an array. The bucket size that our maximum was set to six uh, for this example. And then anything up over six would go into the documents overflow collection. The documents overflow collection can also be represented in different ways and using different patterns. But here what I'm doing is I'm creating a separate document for each overflow. The overflow collection would be very sparsely used because given our data, we're looking at a long tail. So essentially we come back to the idea that the representation is the same. You just need to pick one. Now there's one final use case that most people probably didn't see. This is based on a real customer experience that I had. Um, I was helping a customer. Uh, I was called out because a customer said, our CPU usage is at about 90%. It's way too high. We see no reason that our CPU usage should be high. And we're going to have to spend a lot more money on this machine in order to get the kind of performance that we want. Help us figure out why it is that we're using so many resources. So what we did was we looked at the site and we did some deep dives into the different queries that were issuing. And we found that there was a counter that nobody knew about. It was hidden inside of the footer. And whenever somebody loaded the page, that footer issued an update statement. And that update statement was so um, frequent and so highly used on the server that it was taking up about 90% of the CPU. 
So what we did was we introduced something called the approximation pattern. The approximation pattern is a facsimile of an actual value. So it's kind of like a close enough. It's useful when we don't need the actual value, right? In case of page visits, it doesn't matter if 1 million people versus 1 million and five people visited your site. Ultimately, the fact that we're over a million is what we really care about. We're leveraging the law of averages to reduce our overall load. This is very useful for things like page counters, Internet of Things, and et cetera. So this is what this actually looks like. In our original solution, we had an increment hit the database for every single page load. So that increment hit the counters collection, that was stored in MongoDB, and that had to be pushed to disk. So no wonder they were using 90% CPU because there's a lot of work that gets involved for every single increment that happens you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of times a second. By using the approximation pattern, what we did is we reduced the number of actual increments that we did by incrementing by a much larger number. In the case of my example, we're incrementing by 10. In the case of the customer that I mentioned, we started incrementing by 100. And the way that we did that was by creating a counts collection. That counts collection had one document called page views. That page views had a single count. And then you can see at the bottom, we only incremented at a random interval. The law of averages states that every 100 page loads, we're going to be updating our counter. So our counter will be fairly accurate over time. And this is a way that we significantly reduced the amount of load on that server. We went from 90% down to probably about 10 to 5% on that server. Thanks, Justin. That brings us to the conclusion of our talk. As you go away, there are a few things we want you to, to get out of this talk. The first one is we do have a flexible methodology. So don't reinvent the wheel. Use the flexible methodology to make your development faster. Secondly, share a common vocabulary. So make it easy to talk to each other by using the pattern names. When you do that, you, you share the common definition, and there's no ambiguity about what people are trying to do in the design. And finally, use those patterns that we've talked about today and all the other ones that we document. Those are plug and play components uh, for your future designs. We have a bunch of additional resources. If you want to know more about the patterns, first, there was a series of blogs that Ken Alger and I did last year. Secondly, these patterns are very well documented uh, in our class on data modeling, which is M320 uh, at university.mongodb.com. And thirdly, uh, Justin uh, did a blog on the paging with the on paging with the bucket pattern uh, this year. This is pretty cool. You can see that Justin is very passionate about the bucket pattern in this blog. And then finally, we have MongoDB Consulting Services. Um, I mentioned that I'm a consulting engineer, so if you have additional uh, needs in terms of getting help designing your schema, MongoDB can help with that. Feel free to reach out to um, our consulting services team uh, at the URL displayed on the screen. And finally, before you go, uh, I want you to remember to go register at university.mongodb.com. So we have courses that cover everything you want to learn about MongoDB. Courses are free. Our goal is for you to have all the required knowledge to be successful in building and deploying system using MongoDB. So thanks for listening and enjoy the other presentations at this conference. Have a great day. Thank you for coming.